All right. Okay, welcome back to the third session. Any questions from the previous session before we go forward? Any questions? Yes. Sorry, any questions? Any questions? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, your question is, did he have the awareness? Of? OK. All right, please sit down. So the question is, um, uh, the question is, when Jesus was here, um, did he get an awareness that he was gone? So now we have to think this through. Before Jesus became man, before his incarnation, he, he was God. So he had the attributes of God, which is omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. He knew everything. But in, in his incarnation, he laid aside everything, those attributes. He laid aside omniscience, which means he didn't know everything. He laid it aside. He, he didn't cease being deity. He was still deity in origin. But he laid aside his powers or at powers of deity. Omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. And he became a there is a disturbance. So, uh, in his incarnation, he was not omnipresent. He was confined to that human being. He was not omnipresent. As a baby. As a baby, he had to be protected. Right? And he wasn't omniscient. That means he had to learn. He grew in wisdom and stature, the Bible says. He was taught by the Father. The Bible says. That means. There was a learning process. So he came to know the father's will, the father's plan, the father's. He grew in knowledge. Isaiah 50 was that in the morning by morning, father would wake him up and teach him, open his ear to ear. So there was this still a learning process. So, in that journey, he knew. He, uh, how and when, we don't know. But we can see this in the history. Uh, we cannot hear, I'm sorry. But Jesus prays. He's praying to the Father. He says, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you. That means? He's having, he now know, he knows that he, he was co equal with the Father and he had glory with the Father. So he's praying for that to be restored. Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the world. Which means there was that glory he had with the Father, which he didn't have now. But he's asking the Father to for it to be restored, which happened then. He ascended to heaven. As to not able to follow but, you because, brothers, uh, Venkatesh's mic is open. And in that journey, he was, he, was, he understood the purpose. That's why he could stay. I am. I and the Father are one. So that means there, at that some point, there was that recognition of who he was, that he was God in part. Right. So it's very hard for us to understand how can an, an omniscient God have to grow in wisdom and knowledge? How, how, why would an omniscient God need to be taught by the Father? Right. Because he was growing. He had laid aside his omniscience. He was growing. And then even on the earth he said, no man knows the, the hour except the Father. You know, so the timing also. So yes, he grew in knowledge, he grew in understanding, he grew to know who he was, 
and you could see it in in what he said as he began his ministry yeah when exactly we don't know but there was this journey he made yeah. so okay think about it right um Okay, they're saying not able to listen. Pastor, we're not able to hear. Okay, I think I will mute this. There's a mic that is open. There's someone okay. whose audio is open and there's noise. Okay, they're saying we couldn't hear your entire explanation. Can you hear now? Is it better? I can repeat it. Okay, I think um, there was some music coming from Venkatesh or something. So uh, if, if you can please keep all your mics on mute, uh, it will help us. Okay, so let me just repeat what we just said. So the question that was asked was, um, when Jesus... When Jesus, uh, in his incarnation, in his earthly life, uh, did he know, or you know, did he come to know that he was God? And so we were explaining this that prior to his incarnation, he as God, he had he was omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. He knew all things. In the incarnation, he laid aside these divine attributes of omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience. And the Bible is teaching us, is showing us that he had to grow in wisdom and stature. That means mentally and physically he had to grow. And the Bible is telling us that he was taught by the Father. Isaiah 50 verse 4, that morning by morning the Father woke him up and taught him. Jesus himself said, John 8, 28, 29, as a father teaches me, that's what I speak. So he was taught by the Father, he grew. So obviously the question is, uh, if he had omniscience on the earth, why would he need to be taught? So the conclusion is he was not omniscient. That means he had to grow just like any of us in, in knowing. But as he made this journey of being taught by the Father, growing up, being instructed by the Father, he obviously got to know who he was because in his teaching he said before Abraham was, I am, I and the Father are one. In his prayer he prayed, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world was, John 17, right? So, uh, so these references are John 8, um, um, John 10, 30, and also uh, John 17, I think verse 4. So at some point in this journey, he came to know who he was, he, that he, in a sense, he was deity. In John 5, 26, he says, you know, the Father... The life which the Father has in Himself, He has given to the Son to have in Himself. That means He had the same life, the Zoe life of God. John 5, 26. So He came to understand these things. So the answer to the question is yes. In His journey, in His incarnation, as He journeyed, these things were revealed to Him. Right? And yet He was not omniscient. He didn't know everything because He says, you know, of that time and that season, it's only in the Father's hand. So there are certain things he didn't know in his earthly journey. Okay, so that's a quick summary of what I had just said. Let's go forward. We, in this last session, um, we want to talk about following Jesus in ministry. Right? Yes. Sorry. Yes. So, uh, so the question is, in the New Testament we follow Jesus, whom did the people in the Old Testament follow, right? So in the Old Testament, uh, they knew God as Yahweh, Yahweh God, right? And uh, as they journeyed with Yahweh God, they also understood that, this, that Yahweh God was God in three persons. Um, they had the revelation of the Son of Man. So you see this very clearly in Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel has a vision. He sees the Ancient of Days, and he sees the Son of Man at the right hand of the Father, the Son of Man. So they understood, oh, the God we worship is a triune God. 
and they also understood the spirit of God spirit of God so ruah is the Hebrew word for this for, for spirit or air so slowly they understood God in three persons Yahweh God the Son of Man the ruah of God in the spirit of God right? the worship and they worship so that's why in the Old Testament also you begin to see the revelation. You know, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The hand of the Lord came upon him. Uh, this, you know, uh, they, they're just talking about, right from Genesis 1, 1, you know, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Yeah, so the revelation was given to understand God as a triune God. And that continues in the New Testament. The New Testament also presents God as a triune God, God the Father, God the Son. God the Holy Spirit but now there's so much more clarity on you know God the Father God the Son God the Holy Spirit so we worship God Yahweh God he's a triune God Father Son Holy Spirit co-equal and each person of the Godhead fully represents the Godhead yeah. so. mm -hmm. So, so the question is, uh, you know, in Bible times and the Old Testament, people practice idolatry. Now, how did these people come to know the true and living God? Uh, so, very quickly, I'll answer this. Now, in Romans chapter two, verse fifteen, it says that God has put into the heart of every person the law of God is written in every person's heart which is the conscience so firstly in Romans 2 15 every person there's some the way every person ha has been created by God there is the law of God already in them we call it the conscience that means something inside them is telling them there is God then in Romans chapter 1 verse 19 20 Paul says the invisible attributes of God I think it's verse 19 20 it says the invisible attributes of God are revealed to us in his creation so that nobody is without excuse that means as people look at the creation around us as we look at it it's it, it's revealing to us God it's revealing to us the glory of God now of course God doesn't want us to worship the creation but the creation, this is in verse 20, yeah. The invisible attributes of God are revealed to us in creation. So people look at it and say, ah, oh, there has to be a God. Otherwise, how can all everything be in this order? Right? So the Bible is telling us the attributes of God, the very attributes of the Godhead are revealed in his creation. So one, conscience. Two, creation. And third would be the, when, when God is speaking directly to people, they encounter God and they come to know him. Right? So these three ways, people in the Bible times, Old Testament, they came to know God. And even the same thing can happen today. Right? There's a conscience, there is creation, and then there is also an encounter with God. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, question, what is the difference between the Spirit mentioned in Genesis 1 chapter and the Holy Spirit who came from Jesus when Jesus was taken to heaven? Same, same. There is no difference. Um, the Holy Spirit or the Spirit, meant, Spirit of God mentioned in the Old Testament. He is the same in the New Testament. So uh, God, the Holy Spirit, has not changed. Now keep in mind in the Bible there are different terms used to describe the Holy Spirit. He's the Spirit of God. He is the Spirit of the Lord. He is the anointing. He's the Spirit of the Father. He's the Spirit of Truth. He's the Spirit of Grace. He's the Spirit of Wisdom. So all these terms, but referring to the same Holy Spirit. Just focusing on different attributes, His attribute, but same Holy Spirit. So don't get confused by these terms. We're talking about the same God, the same Holy Spirit. 
Okay, so let's move into this last session. We're going to talk, we're talk, talking about following Jesus in ministry. So first session, our call is to follow Jesus. Second session, follow the lifestyle of Jesus. Follow his lifestyle. Thirdly, follow his ministry. Right? That means when we minister to people, Jesus is our model. Right? We want to follow his example. We want to minister or we want to serve people the way Jesus served people. And we will just highlight a few things in this session. The first thing that we can say about the ministry of Jesus is that it came from his place of intimacy. One of his main things about his lifestyle was his intimacy with God. Ministry came from his place of intimacy, his relationship with God. So for you and I, we must be very clear. Ministry must flow from your relationship with God. Ministry is not some activity or work you're doing. It's not some job. Not activity, some work. No. Ministry is an overflow of your relationship with God. Never forget that. Because If it's not coming from your relationship with God, then it's just a job, it's just a work, it's just some activity, it's just some, something you're doing. No. Let's look at some scriptures here. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 6. Matthew 6. And verse 6, Jesus said this, But you, Matthew 6, verse 6, But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in, in the secret place, and your Father who sees in the secret, secret will reward you openly so what jesus saying you go and pray to your father in secret so imagine you're in a room close the door only person who is seeing you in that room is god to god I'm alone here, nobody to give me tali baja. <laughs> nobody giving me hand clap. Nobody coming and saying very nice. Nothing. Alone. Ah. Your father who sees you in secret, what will he do? He will reward you in openly, public. So, what happens in public is a result. Of what's happening in private. That is real ministry. Now, of course, uh, you know, some, you know, because today you have so much of tools and methods and techniques, you people can do anything. You know, you can set up a big auditorium, this, that, and make things happen. But that won't have the impact on people's lives what really changes people's lives what really impacts people's lives is what you're doing in your secret with the father so this is something you have to hold nobody can force it on you it's between you and god father i want to be in that secret place and you will take care of what's happening in public i will leave that to you I'm not worried. Of course, I want to do a good job. Like, you know, when you get up on Sunday or wherever, 
whenever you go preach, of course, you want to prepare, you want to do it well, you dress properly, you, you know, you do those things that you do properly. I'm not saying, you know, don't do those things. But the main thing is, if you are there in the secret place with God, He will take care of what is happening in public. You don't have to worry. But that's what ministry is. It is an overflow of what's happening in private. You understand? Now, nobody will know what you're doing in private. Nobody will know. Because only your Heavenly Father sees you. So it's between you and God, really. It's between you and God. And you, uh, you, you and I, we must be faithful in that secret place. Be faithful. You know? And know that ministry will come from there. Ministry will come from there. What you're doing in private, in the secret place. That's where ministry is born. Okay? So, um, let's go to John 14, please. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. We want to look at verses 21 and 23. John chapter 14. John 14, verses 21 and 23. Jesus said, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my, by my Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. So you want to have a revelation of Jesus? You want to have Jesus manifest himself to you? What must we do? We love him. And you keep his commandments. So if you love me, you keep my commandments, I will reveal myself to you. So our revelation of God comes from there, comes through that. Of course, you can read books, you can read devotionals, you can read this person, listen to that sermon. All of that is good if you know for learning. But true revelation comes like this. If you love him, you obey his commandments. Jesus said, I will come and I'll reveal myself to you. I will reveal. I will let you see more and more of me. If you love me, you keep my commandments. I will reveal myself to you. Look at verse 23. He said, if anyone loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So, there is the revelation, and then there is the habitation, meaning God dwelling with you. So if you want, you and I, if we want to be people who walk with the revelation of God and the habitation of God, God dwelling with us, this is the key. You love him, you keep his word. You obey his command, you keep his word. What will happen? Jesus will reveal himself to you. Keep on revealing himself to you. And the Father and the Lord will come and dwell with you. You'll, have, you'll carry the presence of God. You'll have the habitation of God with you. And ministry comes out of that. Because you cannot give something you don't have. If you don't have the revelation of God, you can't give some revelation to others. Correct? You can repeat what somebody else said. You can say, John, 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 so, so he said this, and John, John, John said, yeah, you can repeat somebody else, but your own right to, to say, this is who, for revelation to come out of your life. You cannot do it. And for people to encounter the presence of God, when they come to you, they encounter God. Oh, how does that happen? Here. John 14, 21 and 23. If you love me, you keep my commandments, I will reveal myself to you. If you love me, you keep my word, I will come and dwell with you. And that 
is what ministry is. That means you're, the revelation you have received, you're sharing. The presence you are carrying, you're giving. That's ministry. I understand. Yes or no? Yes. That's ministry. Amen? So, ministry flows out of your personal relationship with God. That is true ministry. Now, of course, you know, a lot of people can do a lot of other things. They can read other books, like I said. You can read a lot of other books. You can read a lot of sermons. There's nothing wrong with reading books and listening to sermons and all of that. That is all good, but it must become personal. It must become your revelation. You must get understand. Yeah. And you must carry the presence of God. Right? It shouldn't be an echo. You be a voice. You understand it? Yeah? So, ministry. We see this. That... Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's come for Jesus also, and the challenge is for us to come from that place of intimacy with God. Second, in the ministry of Jesus, he spent a lot of time teaching and preaching. He went from city to city, Crowds of people came to hear him teach and preach. That means to speak the word. So you and I must also speak the word. Right? So the Lord Jesus, in his ministry, he spent a lot of time teaching the word to people. They came to hear him teach. And he taught in many different ways. He taught through parables, he stories. So many, but he spent time teaching. Can you imagine three days teaching continuously? People sat, didn't go and eat. They sat and listened for three days. And after that, somebody says, Lord, they've been sitting here three days. They must be hungry now. Give them some food to eat. Can you imagine? Right? So the Lord Jesus spent a lot of time teaching and preaching the word of God. So that's the second thing in the ministry. Teach and preach God's word. Teach and preach God's word. Make time for it. It is not very fashionable these days. Everybody wants TikTok you know, <laughs> or Instagram. Fast. Give me fast. 30 seconds, one minute video. I want. So nobody wants to listen more than five minutes, one minute. Don't fall for that. We have to teach and preach the word of God. Yeah. Yeah, you have some music to worship God. Nothing wrong with that. You can use PowerPoint so people can see what you're saying. You can have LED screen so people can see. All that is fine. But the content must be the word of Because Jesus himself spent a lot of time with the people teaching and preaching the word of God. He spent. People came to hear. Yeah. So, in the ministry, give importance to the word of God. To the preaching and the teaching of the word of God. Straight from the Bible. You know, yeah, you can use some stories here and there, fine. But don't make the story the main point. Make the word of God the main thing. Yeah. We look at one scripture in Acts 20, verse 32. Acts 20, verse 32. Paul is giving his final words to the leaders in the church in Ephesus. And this is what he tells them. Acts 20, verse 32. He says... Acts 20, verse 32. 
He says, so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. So he, what's he telling them? He says, you know, he, he's not going to see these leaders anymore. He said, you know, if you read the whole passage, he's telling them, ah, this is the last time I'm seeing you. And this is final words to them. He says, I'm committing you to God and to his word. To the word of grace, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. So his final word is, brothers, commit yourself to God and to his word. That's it. Commit yourself to God and to his word. So in your teaching, in your preaching, that's it. Just Teach the word, preach the word. And the apostle Paul wrote, you know, he said, in the last days, people will not want to hear wholesome words. They will want to hear things that make them feel nice. But he told Timothy, Timothy, you, this is in 1 Timothy 6, he says, you must speak the word, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. So that's our responsibility. It says you, uh, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 3 if you don't preach wholesome words, uh, yeah. And also, yeah. Sorry. So, give yourself to the preaching and the teaching of God's word. And uh, teach, exhort these things, he tells Timothy. Yeah. So, give yourself to that, the teaching of the word. Jesus spent so much time, so you and I must do that. Even though it's, you know, may not be very, very uh, uh, fashionable and so on. Yeah. Um, um, First Timothy chapter six. Uh, what was he saying? Yeah. Um, Okay, and also Second uh, Timothy, oh, sorry, Second Timothy chapter four, verses one through five. Second Timothy chapter four, verse one through five. Let me read that. Our Second Timothy chapter four, verses one through five. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Je Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing, and His kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables like man made stories. But you be watchful in all things, and your afflictions do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So Second Timothy chapter four, verses one to five. So he's saying, Timothy, the time will come. They won't want to listen to sound teaching. They want to hear stories. Tell me a story. They want to hear, they want to listen to things that make them feel good. No. But you preach the word. You teach the word. You fulfill your ministry. Right? So that's important. Number two was teaching and preaching. Number three is doing the Father's works. Doing the Father's works. So what do we see in the ministry of Jesus? He gave importance to the supernatural. Doing the Father's works. 
Now, I want you to think about this, and you know, we, we will learn a lot more as we journey through uh, in, in the coming semesters on this. But I want you to think about this. If you go with me to John chapter 10, John chapter 10, there was a time when the Jews, they came to Jesus and they said, Tell us, are you the Messiah or not? John chapter 10 and uh, verse 24. John 10, verse 24. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, that means if you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. So the Jews come to Jesus. So, you know, tell us. Are you the Messiah? John 10, 24. What does Jesus respond? Verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So notice what Jesus, what is his answer to the Jews? Say, I told you, but you're not listening. Then he says, the works that I do, the miracles, the healings, the deliverance, the works that I do, they bear witness of me. Go down a few verses. John chapter 10. And um, verse 30. Let's see, let me just give you the exact verse. And John 10, 25. Yeah, verse 37. John 10, verse 37. Jesus says this. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe in me. Verse 38. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe. That the Father has sent me. Think about this. In verse 37, Jesus says, If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe in me. But if I do the works, then even if you don't believe what I'm saying, believe me because of the works. So, in the ministry of Jesus, the works, when you talk about the works here, he's talking about the miracles, the healings, the deliverance that he was doing. They were very, very important. They were very important. Are you listening? Yeah. Because he said, if I don't do the works, don't believe me. They came and asked, are you the Messiah? You tell us. He said, I told you you're not believing, but look, the works. And then he says, if I don't do these works, don't believe. But if I do the works, then you have to. Even if you're not listening to me, you have to. Look at the works. So question is, how important were the works, the miracles, to the ministry of Jesus? It very, was very important. Very important. And the interesting thing is, Jesus said, that we must continue the works. Believers, we must continue doing the works. Where did he say it? A few chapters down, John 14. So if you go to John the 14th chapter, Jesus is preparing his disciples that he's going to go away. So he says, in my father's house are many mansions, I'm going to go. Then, you know, John 14, verse 1. Uh, and then... Uh, and if I go, I'll come again and prepare to you to myself. Then Thomas, verse 5. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? So, you know, so Jesus is saying, I'm going to my father's house. Thomas is thinking, till today, he has not shown us his father. Father's house. Where is his father's house? Lord, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the, how can we know the way? Then Jesus says, I am the way. 
the truth, the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Then Philip comes up with this question. Verse 8. Lord, show us the Father. Till today you haven't shown us the Father. Show us the Father. And then Jesus says, verse 9. If, have I been so long with you, Philip? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And to his own disciples, who have been with him now almost three years, what does he say? Look at that in verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Look at verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So even to his own disciples, they've been with him three years. He says, Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father is in me. He's working through me. If you don't believe my words, believe me because of the works that I'm doing. You see all these miracles? Philip, you see all these miracles? Believe me because of these miracles. Are you listening? So even to his own disciples, he's saying, you believe who I am because of the miracles. Believe who I am. I, am. I came from the Father. Father is in me. I'm going back to the Father. Believe what I'm saying because of these miracles. To his own disciples. And then he makes the statement, John 14 verse 12. He who believes in me. Next verse. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works, because I go to my Father. That means believers must continue doing the works so that people will know who Jesus Christ is, that he has gone to the Father. So we must continue doing the works, the miracles, the healings, praying for the people, ministering to people, expecting the miraculous, continue doing. The reason I'm emphasizing it is because in many denominations, they say miracles are over. In many denominations, many seminaries, they will teach the days of miracles are over. No, it's not over. Because right here in verse 12, Jesus said, those who believe in him will do the works he did, and even greater works. And what's the reason? Because people must know who Jesus really is. Are you understand that? Even in Jesus' time, for his own disciples, and to all the Jews and people who are coming and asking, are you the Messiah? He pointed to one thing. If you don't believe my words, then look at my works. Let my works be a sign, a testimony to you that you know, he is the Messiah. To his own disciples, he said. And then he said, my disciples, those who believe in me must continue doing these works. Why? Because people need to know who Jesus is. That he is the one who came from the Father. He's gone to the Father. He's alive today. His life didn't end 2,000 years ago. He's with the Father. That's why even today there are miracles in his name. You understand that? So we follow Jesus in the ministry. You know, many, many people will tell, don't pray for this. Even now, even now in these days, you know, sometimes people will call, people will send me email. Why you pray for the sick? Why are you teaching people about the gifts of the Spirit? This is, this is not good. And they attack. They say all these things. Sometimes these emails are very nasty. You know, they write, uh, you should not be telling people about Jesus heals. You must not be tell, teaching about faith. You should not be telling people, hey, but Jesus taught so much about faith. You read the Gospels. Which Bible are you reading? You know, it's like these are Christians. Like sometimes these are Christian leaders who will attack. They will say all these things. I don't know which Bible they are reading or which Jesus they are following. But as far as I know, the Jesus of the Bible is the Jesus of today. He hasn't changed. Amen? 
So you will face these kinds of things. They will, people, I'm talking, you know, in the church, people attack. Oh, you should not be praying for the sick. You should not be prophesying. You should not believe in the gifts. It's in the Bible. Jesus said, those who believe will do the works. And even in his own ministry, he pointed to the works. How much more should you and I today? Are you listening? Yeah. So follow Jesus in your ministry. There will be a lot of pressure, I tell you. Especially all these big theologians, they'll all say, oh, you should not pray for the sick and all that is over. And they'll, have, they'll write thick, thick books on why miracles are not for today. All those things. It's very sad. You determine, I am following Jesus. If it was important for Jesus, it's important for me. If Jesus said it, I will follow it. Amen. Nobody can erase the words of Jesus from the Bible. Nobody has a right to do that. I will follow his words. I will not be intimidated by all these things that people say. No, I will stand up for the truth. I will say that Jesus still heals. Jesus still delivers. There is still power in his name. Amen? We will not give up on that. So in the ministry, remember, first of all, ministry comes from your relationship with God. Secondly, you preach and teach the word. Thirdly, do the works. Do the Father's works, which is the miraculous, the healing, the deliverance, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Expect that. Pray for people. Amen? And the last one is you disciple others. You disciple others. Now, can you imagine Jesus is walking on the earth. He gets 12 disciples and he tells them, I am giving you authority. You cast out devils and you heal the sick and you go preach. Then he gets another 70. And he tells those 70. So there was 12, there was another 70. You go. You go into all the cities. You preach. You heal. You deliver. It's cast out devils. That means he is raising up people. He didn't say, I am the only one who will heal. Every person who needs healing, bring them to me. Every person who needs deliverance, brings them to me. I'm the only person here. All of you, don't pray for anybody. You must not pray for anybody. You must not cast out devil. Only I will do. He didn't say that. He told the 12, you go do it. He told the 70, you go do it. And then before he went to heaven, he told his disciples, go, you make disciples and tell them to do whatever I told you. That means everyone. Are you understanding? He didn't keep this for himself. He raised up disciples. And he said, you go do it. You go do it. You heal. You cast out devils. You preach the gospel. You go do it. So we also must be like that. That we must raise up other people. Empower them, equip them and send them. Go. You go do. You go. You also minister. Amen? Because Jesus did that. He raised up disciples. Not only 12, 70. And then he said, you go and make disciples of the whole world. Teach them everything I've taught you. Give it to them. You must have the same heart. So don't make ministry just about you. Make ministry about raising other, others. Raising others up. Amen? Jesus did that. He raised up. 12, he raised up 70, he raised up many people. So, when you follow Jesus in the ministry, these are four things I just want to highlight to us. Number one, it must come from our relationship with God, our place of intimacy. Number two, we must teach and preach the word. Stay with the word. Today, again, you know, if you look around, people are preaching all kinds of fancy things. No, stay away from all that. Just 
Open the Bible, teach from the Bible. Speak the word of God. Three, do the Father's works. Pursue the mir miraculous, the supernatural. Right? And number four, disciple others. Raise up other people that they can also do the work of God. Amen? So, main message today. Main message today. Follow Jesus. Right? Just follow. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Follow Jesus. Follow his lifestyle. Follow his ministry. Question. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he meant, so the question is, did Jesus, you know, when Jesus said in John 14, 12, greater works, what were those greater works? Did he actually mean greater works? And the answer is yes. And if you think of what's happening today, example, th there are miracles that are happening today which could never have happened uh, in the ministry of Jesus. Example. Suppose somebody has had surgery and they took out some organ. Now, in those days, they didn't do those things. But you pray and a, a kidney that has taken out suddenly comes back. The doctor said, I took out the kidney. Where it came from? It's, it's like, it's a greater work. It's a miraculous thing. Or somebody has implants today. Right? They couldn't do implants in Bible times, right? They may put metal, they may put something. And suddenly the metal becomes bone. I know Jesus turned water to wine. But metal becoming bone, Jesus could never have done it because in those days they didn't have those kinds of procedures. But today something like that happens. You know, um, or so, so these, I, I would categorize these as those greater miracles right things that could not have happened in jesus time just because of the way things were but this is still jesus doing the works through us it's not like we are doing it he's doing it through us it's still his works but they are in in one way greater than what we have seen or would have took, taken place in bible times you know like this you can think of people being healed online to the internet you know, or on a phone call you know like uh, some other part of the world, you know, you, you, you're preaching from here, they may be watching some other part of the world, they get healed on, you know, online. Now, that's something that, you know, I know Jesus healed in a distance, in the sanctuary of sun, but this is like way another part of the world, you know, it's in some way greater. So I, I think he just literally meant greater, both in numbers and in terms of how those miracles would happen. And we have mm -hmm. the privilege of doing that, of seeing that happen. Okay, uh, let's see the questions on the chat. Uh, um, when we rise up others in church ministry, if they divide the church and go, then how to handle such situations? Uh, another question is, why are we why still have multitude of unbelievers? Uh, uh, it's also great, now the comment here, it's also great uh, because of the way the gospel is spread now and many believers are there today. And uh, uh, Apostle Paul, he said, imitate me. He did all of the four points about, yeah, answers, yes. Okay, so, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just answer these questions very quickly. We, we don't have too much time. But if, you know, if people, we raise up people and they cause problems and they go, uh, we just let them, we just release them. We see, for example, in the ministry of Jesus, he raised up 12, but one of them, you know, uh, betrayed Jesus. Uh, even in the ministry of Paul, he raised up many people, but then there are people from Paul's ministry, like Demas, who forsook him. They went away. So these kinds of things happen because people are people, but we just release them and let God take care of it. We don't retaliate, don't take any revenge. Um, and uh, why there's still multitudes of unbelievers? Well, we have because we have a work to do. Um, that there's just many people, and, and it's a great privilege 
that we are living in a time when there are so many people who need to hear the gospel. So we look at it as, look, we, we need to do a lot more work uh, in reaching people with the gospel. Okay. All right. Uh, there's a lot more that we're going to learn over the next three years, so we'll journey together. Let's rise to our feet, please. I'll close. Uh, I know our time is up. So, main thing today, follow Jesus. Our call is to become like Jesus. Follow Jesus. Follow his lifestyle. Follow his ministry. He's the standard. He's whom we're going to follow and imitate. Always keep your eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, and I pray, God, that everything we've heard today will really be settled in our hearts and minds, and it will continue to ring inside of us. We will not forget these things, God, that our goal and our desire will, will be to follow Jesus, to become like him, to follow his lifestyle, to follow his ministry. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. Can take a break and come back for hour. Thank you.